What's going on, y'all? It's your boy Kofi Kingston, a.k.a. one-third of the New Day. You're not going to say it with me, sir? Oh, oh yeah, God. come on. You better participate. Yeah, Let's try it again. <laughs> one-third of the New Day, and you are watching The Young and the Wrestlers. Ha, 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 ha. Welcome to the Young and the Wrestlers, the Pop Culture's WWE podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Betson, by myself here again tonight, but we'll get to that in just a moment. This is our Money in the Bank review, and it comes at you on a Wednesday at 8 a.m. on your podcast services, 9 a.m. on those YouTubes. If you want to join that wrestling conversation, head over to facebook.com slash group slash the pop culture. Follow us on, t- on t- uh, Twitter. Discord, Instagram, all those links are in the down below area. If you want to join the conversation as it happens, head over to twitch.tv slash thepopcultures where you can watch us record this show live. Get in the chat and have a damn good time. Uh, Additionally, if you want to support the show, you can financially at patreon.com slash thepopcultures as well as thepopcultures.com slash shop where you can buy uh, shirts and other assorted shit without logos on it. That is is right ladies and gentlemen i am once again by myself recording this episode of the young and the wrestlers uh sadly gem was unable to join us tonight uh as she has had a personal loss uh so a, a friend of hers has has since passed away uh and you know she needed a little bit of time so we we have of course give gem our condolences and uh we'll give her as much time as she needs uh, so she won't be joining us for this Money in the Bank review, and she'll also not be joining us for the following episode of the Raw review. But that is fine. Anyways, as I said, I'm here by myself, which is great. If you're watching the VOD, uh, you get to see the full set for once. It's been ages since I've been able to get to show the full set, you know, mostly because it's like, you know, we're doing the, the uh, you know, the online things. It's just my face but instead we get to show off the full set and i get to have a direct one-on-one chat with yourself and as we said this week that right now we are chatting about wwe's money in the bank 2020 uh it's the the pay-per-view for the month of may and uh this guy right off the bat it was a lovely short pay-per-view i think it topped out at like two and a half hours which was really really nice actually because i was expecting to be a much longer show because that's what we're used to what we're used to receiving from uh the wwe however uh when we hit sort of just before the ladder match i was like man this is gonna be like an hour and a half main event jesus christ that's gonna be gnarly but nah mate we were just a, it was just a short show, but uh, let's get it off up and running. Let's get into it. So with the kickoff show, we had Jeff Hardy versus Cesaro. This was a last minute addition to the card. This happened probably uh, like 16 hours before the pay-per-view kicked off, which was really inconvenient for me uh, because I uh, and our good friend Mad Dog, two hours, 21. Thank you very much for the whole, whole show. I thought it was 2.31, but no, 2.21. Uh, yeah, so Mad Dog, friend of the show who just gave us a little comment there uh he too used the power of wwe 2k20 to predict the pay-per-view and just like myself we were shafted because of these late notice additions to to the card but uh no that's fine so jeff hardy versus cesaro was an interesting one uh most because a was announced last minute and to you know it's kickoff show like we i personally expected we would probably see uh the raw tag belts in the kickoff show you know raiders versus street profits or something but that didn't seem to happen so instead we we got this uh it was it was a solid match i uh, i didn't hate it it, it certainly did demonstrate a lot more of uh, Jeff Hardy and sort of he's doing his flippity doo uh versus Cesaro. You know, he's just a bit more of a sort of a power guy, you know, being the big old Swiss cyborg and shit. Uh, that part I really liked. It was a good sort of, you know, storytelling match, I guess. But I kind of enjoyed, you know, just sort of how they work together. I was a bit disappointed that, they, that there wasn't any inclusion of uh, like the bar as a storyline. 
Excuse me while I have a drink there. Because uh, for those that may not know, uh, back in the day, uh, Seamus, who is set up to... He's, I'm going to put my pants up too. Is set to take on uh, Jeff Hardy uh, very soon. Uh, so that's the, that's their new feud right now. And so with <clears throat> so Cesaro and Seamus were in a, a team called The Bar. You know, it's also part of our rating system here. Uh, yeah, we thought maybe there'd be a little bit of tie-in here. Maybe that's where they're going. But no, not at all. It was just Cesaro. Cesaro's, you know, being the good competitor that he is, being thrown into a match at the last minute and still being able to still being able to deliver a really good match. Um, you know, he he is an incredible worker, so it, it was understandable why he'd be in here. Uh, Jeff Hardy, however, did get the win via pinfall. Uh, he did uh, take it take the L from a Swanton bomb. Uh, however, there was also there was a twist of fate was also in there and whisper in the wind. Like so, Jeff Hardy went pretty all out actually uh, on uh, on Cesaro. Uh, first match of the card, we had the SmackDown Tag Team Championships. It was Miz and Morrison versus the New Day versus the Forgotten Sons versus versus the Lucha House Party. So going into this match. I had a rough idea how it was going to go. I was like, okay, uh, Miz and Morrison probably won't get the win here. Uh, mostly because I'm re- I think they're enjoying the story that they have not been beaten in a tag match. Uh, Forgotten Sons, it's way too early. Lucha House Party are there just to take the pin. Therefore, the New Day will probably come out as the victors. And sure enough, I was boom, spot on. Uh, going exactly down like that. Now, a couple of things I want to note in the match that sort of caught my attention. Uh, Grand Metalik had like the gnarliest hair I've ever seen. It was ginormous. It was huge. It was great. They did a lot of awesome sort of flippity doo tag team work, which I really, really enjoyed. Uh, Forgotten Sons, uh, I'm still not there on. Uh, I remember jo- I enjoyed them in their NXT run. However, I it, it never really sunk home for me. So I guess the most I really saw of them was just as these brooding men that didn't say a whole lot. And then they had that great ladder match uh, with the Undisputed Era that I really, really enjoyed. But other than that, it's just kind of, eh. And as we know, they are sort of being the replacement for the revival. Uh, you know, sort of being that that, uh, that team that's, you know, more like, you know, power, fists, punch, rather than sort of teamwork flippies like we would kind of get with the likes of Miz and Morrison uh, as well. Uh, Miz and Morrison were, sort, were, you know, were involved pretty well in the match. Uh, you know, John Morrison did his usual stuff. He did an interesting uh, Starship pain, which didn't quite land properly, but that's fine. I, I've always wanted, okay, I'm just gonna, let's put this out there, chat. Let's have a talk about this. Uh, the Starship pain. I can't seem to find that to look, it looks cool. But I don't know how to make it look like how it could be look effective. It seems a little bit bit off in that way. Um, but uh, on top of that, you know, the Forgotten Sons, they had Jackson Riker ringside as well, as they do, being a trio, which, interesting enough, every every team in this, uh, minus Miz and Morrison, were a trio. So that was a cool little touch. Um, but yeah, so Jackson Riker ended up getting booted out at some point. Just cool, uh, and yeah, as as I mentioned, the new day did get the pin on uh, the Lucha House Party with a, a big E hitting a big ending. Boom, cool. Uh, this match I enjoyed. I thought it was I thought it was actually pretty sweet. I, I'm not even mad uh, about it. However, uh, I'm a little disappointed that I was kind of sort of able to sort of nail it on the head. So my going with predictions, and I literally delivered exactly what it was. That doesn't happen all that often, but I but. Um, it, it wasn't a a, a big uh, surprise, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. I, I I like where this can go in terms of the continued storyline, and I do have uh, 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 additional theories and and potential plans around where I see the the SmackDown Tag Team Championship going. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, next up was another thrown together last minute match. It was originally intended to be MVP versus R Truth which on paper seems dumb uh, and then in execution was 
dumb uh, because we had Bobby Lashley instead come out. So he interrupted uh, with a bit of a bullshitting between both of them uh, and then telling MVP to take the night off. But then uh, R-Truth being R-Truth sort of protested to the idea of uh, not getting a, a, a night off and they end up having a boss. Um, I just want to put it out there. Like R-Truth is, is a treasure. Uh, Chris in the Conway says, the match uh, no one asked for completely uh and adding to the smackdown uh interesting the fact that big e was has been one to win matches as of late that is true there's been a lot of uh uh requests for big e to get a bit of a push radio watson so we were saying it was dumb it was dumb it was unquestionably dumb but like in terms of good dumb uh what i really enjoyed was our truth come out and he sang his regular song but he, it was delivered in such a way that he was almost oblivious to uh, to the crowd around him. Like, there being no crowd around him, sorry. Like, he's still yelling out to the crowd to respond, and he's doing the exact same touch points that he normally would. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. I genuinely laughed out loud uh, watching Truth try to, like, talk to a crowd that isn't there, but, like, unapologetically. Um, I really got a lot of laugh out of that. Uh, uh, Con Osiris Chris Conway in the chat goes truth truth is the WWE greatest of all time he is the GOAT I would say he's certainly up there in terms of being an excellent worker so we so the two matches that we see that popped up out of nowhere with Cesaro and uh, and our truth they're both great workers and we know that they are favorable in the eyes of sort of the upper management at wwe for sort of putting a good match together in a pinch and they i guess they sort of did that so with truth was there entirely to put over lashley uh seeing as i don't give too much craps about about bobby lashley i was like okay but i also understand where they're going as well because in the match as well bobby lashley did sort of go from sort of just just fighting to being angry uh and that seems to, that does to be a common uh thread a common theme uh through the most re his most recent story around lana uh is his anger and his his quickness to anger as well uh sarah goes i didn't know seamus was still wrestling but yeah that's the fun fact sarah so seamus hadn't been for the longest time he had had uh injury i believe he had uh, spinal stenosis as well um but he was able to sort of almost had it one of the two um yeah and he was sort of away for the longest time and then he nicely came back and he looked looks more jacked than ever and uh yeah he's he's kind of not doing a whole lot right now he's kind of just sort of you know demonstrating his power over a bunch of people until like i presumably until jeff hardy was meant to return so he was kind of in a holding pattern until now so it looks like that's sort of kicking into gear but overall match was there uh next up was the smackdown women's championship match it was bailey versus tamina um yeah yeah <laughs> uh I, I don't know what it is i had this discussion the other day uh around uh bailey with josh robinson who joined us uh two weeks ago now uh around bailey he himself is a big bailey fan uh, she has a lot of uh, understanding and respect to her character right now. And he did truly turn me around on my thoughts on her and, and how uh, it is almost for her this struggle uh, to remain relevant, uh, especially with the eyes of like Sasha Banks on her, especially on her title. Um, and on top of that, you know, Sasha Banks sort of putting Tamina in this match, which itself causes a bunch of extra uh, hu <laughs> hubbub and hurdles. Uh so I, I see where they're going, but I, I can't seem to be invested in the SmackDown Women's Championship when uh, when she is involved. But uh, it did... It went all right. It went all right. So Tamina did d demonstrate her strength. She was quite strong over it, with uh, Bailey trying to do a lot to sort of work on... Uh, uh, work on her knee sort of real focus on the leg in order to try like bring down uh tamina because we know she does have the big super kick as well so it's uh, additionally it's just trying to bring the the bigger competitor down so in terms of good storytelling that was 100 percent there I, I really like that um there was a moment with some water in the face and thank and thankfully there was like uh 
there was some distraction there from Sasha Banks, like nothing crazy. So not like uh, result altering distraction, which I kind of thought it was the direction that was going to go. So in order to sort of allow Sasha Banks to come in and get within that title shot to sort of cause uh, cause Bailey to take the loss from Tamina, and then she would come in and as like a defending. Uh, her friend and take and take the belt however that wasn't the case uh there were uh, tamina did attempt to do a a, a splash uh which which uh which wait hang on. so after bailey attempt to counter tamina splash back fighting with super kick oh yeah so super kick small drop Oh, Bailey didn't go too well. Banks interferes which allowed bailey to hit a incredibly awkward <laughs> according to cbs sports crucifix pin so it was uh, essentially a sneaky roll up Whew. excuse me on Tamina uh, which is an interesting result it would, it, this is the result that would have to be um, I, I do wonder whether this will continue further I'm unsure of that but uh, there's grounds here for it to move further ahead if it wanted to uh, so right now we're two for two of belts not changing hands. Uh, next up, uh, next up, Universal Championship, uh, Braun Strowman versus Bray Wyatt. Uh, so this time, you know, we it was a, we were unsure whether it was going to be uh, uh, the Fiend or Bray Wyatt, Funhouse Bray. Uh, it does have to be Funhouse Bray, which was awesome. He comes out all smiley and happy, which I I got a I got a big chuckle at, and him sort of yelling at Michael Cole, being like, "Hey, you guys are doing great work, man. Whatever, what, regardless of people say it, man, like you guys are doing really really well." And he's like, "Oh man, I'm uh I'm scared, I'm excited, but oh, am I am I nervous?" Uh, that made me laugh. Uh, well, and then Braun came out looking like a big old badass Braun that he is, which I really really en- which I also enjoyed that too. Um. As he sort of come in, it came. It Braun really got that run up nice and early. A lot of shoulder tackles, a lot of demonstrations of strength, uh, which was which was fine. Uh, even to a point of a uh, Bray Wyatt like complimenting uh, Braun on his uh, raw strength and and how much he has grown since uh, being a member of the Firefly. Uh, sorry, member of the Wyatt family, because that is sort of the big story coming into this match was uh, Braun and Bray's history, which you know I, I still believe is a, a great a great addition even though their separation wasn't around Braun leaving the family by his decision it was done via a, a draft a couple uh, you know x amount of years ago so for that reason it's like okay the story's a bit gray but i like it uh so there was a moment in time where there was a bit of good uh, you know uh, a lot of ringside work uh you know Braun taking Bray out, doing a boom, 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 a lot of ring throwing into ring posts and stuff like that. And one point that I even jo- I really enjoyed was where um, <laughs> uh, Braun gets smacked, dropped to the mat, and uh, you just hear him go, "Oh shit!" Which I, which I liked a lot. Uh, it's it's, it's that's the one benefit of these uh, empty empty arena shows. You do you are going to hit a lot more, which which is great. Um, you know, I thought, you know, I think that's sort of a, a great little, a great little touch there, which is the benefit of the empty room. Uh, on top of that, uh, we see yeah, Braun Strowman try to go for another, for another uh, shoulder tackle, which uh, Bray dodges, sending Bray uh, Braun through the table, big buff, and that is when Bray sort of gets the turn and starts pushing in that direction as well. Uh, then, uh, then we do sort of see that. And then during that, we have Huskus, uh, the, the, the puppet appear and as, as well, which I thought was fascinating doing the, uh, uh, sort of being the other thing. So uh, that is the one, it was once again, that's the, one of the additional advantages of, um, uh, of being able to do these sort of empty arena shows like the puppets can appear and i was almost expecting the fiend to appear for like on stage so they'll have like you know the sort of this demonstration that they're different people um which would have been a really really cool touch but i think that will happen at some point but it's not going to happen right now uh but one thing that did happen though in terms of you know masks we see uh braun put on the black sheep mask from his white family time and come into the ring and uh you know bray wyatt's like oh my god you've come home you've finally come to your senses and you're willing to join me uh which uh it, it was once again great storytelling uh 
they, you know, they end up sort of, you know, Braun rips his shirt off, they get into it, they embrace, it's very nice, takes the mask off, stomps the shit out of it, and then proceeds to just, like, running power slam him, one, two, three, Braun Strowman retains from a clean win over Bray Wyatt. Uh, I was expecting a, I was expecting a shonky finish here. Personally, I thought there would be some sort of distraction or DQ finish that would have led to them going again. Cause right now it's like, well, what would be the next steps? So we've got backlash and then SummerSlam, you know, we're going to see a repeat as is building up to a bigger story at SummerSlam. Cause right now, if you don't think about it, we'll get to the results of the money in the bank ladder match soon, but I cannot, I, I'm, I cannot pick who would be the next contender for the Universal Championship. Um, so I was wondering whether they would extend this storyline a little bit more, which they may or may not do. We don't know yet, but I, and under the current situation, under the current storyline, I'm not sure where it would go unless they expanded. Overall, really enjoyed the match. I loved the inclusion of the sort of the old stories to sort of bring it in there. Um, I, yeah, it was really cool because like, during the discussion between uh, Braun and and Wyatt, once he put the mask on, I think he's, I'm quoting here, uh, he goes, do you understand what this means? I promise you, I promise that this time everything will be perfect. I like that is this great little sort of nod to, I guess, the ulterior motives of Bray Wyatt and, you know, is he wanting to recruit people for the fun house? Because he, obviously it's not, you know, not the Wyatt family anymore like he isn't the swamp sort of character that he was uh it's this different thing and i i if he is going down the rec- recruiting line I, I think that would be a cool little touch i have a a larger a larger range of characters uh within the fun, fun house to work with it was good i enjoyed that match a lot actually i remember popping pretty hard uh when he popped when he 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 popped up with that sheep mask on um i enjoyed that a lot uh next up was wwe championship drew mcintyre versus seth rollins this match i effing loved i thought this was really really good uh it was long it was by god it was a long match but uh, there was some great work from Seth Rollins with uh, numerous submission attempts, sort of almost working Drew's entire body. So rather than sort of just going for a leg lock, he then shifted that leg lock into kind of like, um, not a Boston Crab, um, uh, a, a face thing. Well, what is it? It's like kind of like the the ask a lot, kind of like the uh, the um, the yes lock. I, I can't think of its name right now because I'm having a brain fart. But the, just the uh, the demonstration that like knowing it's it's it almost if Seth knowing that if he targets and and pushes and squeezes that he may be able to get himself to a point of a victory just by sort of working uh, on Drew. Rather than fighting him, it's just being a bit smarter about it. I like that a lot. Uh, with McIntyre, sort of multiple attempts uh, for claim walls, multiple attempts at Future Shock DDTs. Uh, I I thought it was absolutely amazing. Um, just the, even the storytelling alone, there was a lot of uh, Seth getting him out of the ring, a lot of breaking the 10 count, just in and out, in and out, just a lot of a lot of work on each other. Um what I enjoyed about this the most is from a storytelling perspective is that there is a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of motivation in both these characters. So with Drew McIntyre, he needs to retain this. This is his first big title defense since, uh, winning it at money in the bank. Sorry, winning at WrestleMania for, so having defending here at money at the bank. So th- like if he, he needs to also, he needs to demonstrate that he can be the one to, to be deserving of the title, uh, with Seth Rollins sort of his big, uh, his big, you know, focus right now is that he, that Drew McIntyre isn't deserving, uh, of the championship, uh, as he's not ready to be a leader, um, you know, sort of the leader of, of Raw, which, you know, it's a good story. Like, you know, I, I like it. And then on top of that, you've got Seth Rollins, who being the Monday Night Messiah, uh, his entire character is sort of fighting for that legitimacy right now. So he needs to, if he holds this title, he will demonstrate that he is 
who he says he is, that this whole Messiah thing isn't um, isn't a farce. It is something. It is worth your time. It is worth paying attention to. And by being champion, it completely legitimizes his entire character right now. And I thought that, and then that, so there is a desperation within Seth Rollins to become that winner. And I think we saw that here. And I said that desperation came across in those submission attempts, you know, in multiple stomp attempts. Like there, he he went hard and fast, and and Drew took a lot. He took a lot. Saving him even to a point where he. It just took a you know a, a, some of the submissions, the the stomp, and some other damage as well, and then we're still able to kick out at one. Absolutely amazing. Let me just have a quick swig of my drink. Ah, excuse me. But uh, yeah, no. Overall, I I really enjoyed. I think they went they were fantastic on each other from a wrestling perspective. Uh, Dad Bod, how are you, my friend? Uh, and additionally. Excuse me, I just clear my nose there. And additionally, uh, there's yeah, good storytelling in that wrestling as well. Just sort of how that match is working, showing the desperation of each of them and wanting to get to because both of them had a legitimate push for that to, for that title. So they were both going absolute ham in order to become uh, become the winner. Finally. We had the Money in the Bank ladder match. Now, as we as we know, this was a pre-recorded uh, pre-recorded one at Titan Towers. So, uh, additionally, they you know everyone started at the lo- level one. They'd fight their way to the top of uh, the WWE headquarters, like the raid, but not as good. Um, with the with a ring and the uh, uh, the Money in the Bank briefcase hanging from a uh, from from the roof. Uh, and, and both the men and the women would be taking place at the same time. All right, so let's talk about the women first, and we'll sort of run through that, and then we'll come back. Um, so we in, in this match, we had Dana Brooke, Carmella, Lacey Evans, Nia Jax, and Shayna Baszler, uh, and Asuka, of course. So the start of this for the women was a bit jarring. So they're standing there in the lobby in front of the elevators. Music hits, weirdly. And they sort of walk out as if it's like a presentation. They're like, hey, and they do a little bit, you know, um, Nia Jax sort of T poses at the camera. Uh, you know, Carmella comes in wearing a shirt that I don't know how it hold, it held all of her in. Um, there's a lot of tape and a lot of spray glue involved, I think. Uh, Lacey Evans, sort of usual attire. Shayna Baszler, just looking like she's ready to murder anybody, uh, which I, I, I do love the menacing factor of, uh, of Shayna Baszler. But, uh, as you know, the final music hits for Asuka, you know, they're, they're looking around. She doesn't make it, make herself known. Look up. There she is. First floor, second floor. Big splash uh, onto everyone, knocks them all down, takes advantage, gets in the elevator, smacks that button, and gets herself uh, moving on the elevator. And they, the other women continue to start uh, running frantically. Uh, they then make their way into sort of an office area uh, with a uh, uh, like a meeting rooms and stuff like that. Uh, there was a situation where, for some reason, uh, Dana Brooke gets... Uh, in the face of Naya or Shayna and says, tell me where the briefcase is. I don't understand why that was said. Like that is really genuinely baffles me because none of that lines up like i how was she under the impre- under the impression that the briefcase wasn't on the roof no i understand like, like in terms of a very bad storytelling they set up for a part where they break into this um this conference room and in that conference room there is a briefcase hanging from the roof it is a clear briefcase with literal money inside it uh so 
the idea she she's believing that this is the this is the money in the bank briefcase so she grabs it she was like woo, 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 i got it and that's sort of after you know bussing around uh nia jack she took a ladder uh, sorry, look, sorry took a ladder she took a chair uh carmella uh was there as well shannon was there they were but everyone's sort of down and out uh then a very poorly edited cut to Stephanie McMahon. Uh, and this is one of those things. Like you can tell that this was a not needed, which uh, mad dog supports in the chat. He goes, look like the briefcase that Dana grabbed had actual money in it, which it did. Uh, Stephanie McMahon was not needed in this full stop. She was not. So yeah, we cut to Stephanie McMahon who is standing against uh, ambiguous white wall. Uh, this was clearly filmed on a mobile phone. Uh, because it is all color, color balance wrong. It does not match uh, the overall look of everything else. It's very close. Uh, Steph's looking very soft. It's almost like she's been slightly, not I would say touched up, but like the lighting is very different. Uh, she's there, sort of says, hey, uh, you got, what the hell are you guys doing? The briefcase is on the roof. This is the Money in the Bank meeting room. Uh, can you sort out Nia Jack? She's drawing the comedy wasn't there the delivery from Nia, uh sorry delivery from stephanie was not fluid enough for it to be convincing it was like hey what are you doing don't you know that the briefcase is on the roof you know this is the conference room you guys are ruining the building you know please please clean up the drool from Nia Jax. It's like, it, it didn't land. Like, it felt, none of it felt natural, which completely throws off because she's supposed to sort of be like, hey, you guys are wrecking the building, but did not deliver any of that emotion. Mad Dog had to look like it was filmed from a house. And I guarantee it probably was. And I don't know why it needs to be spliced in. Like, there are a bunch of cameos, which we'll get to in a moment. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me, indeed. Um, however, it just felt really, really unnecessary. Uh, saying that, though, we did then uh, have uh, Dana Brooke get get skonked in the head with a framed poster of uh, Carmella holding the money in the bank beef, briefcase, uh, the beefcase. That's right. Um, <laughs> which set up for a great comedy bit later. Um, but yeah, so Mala sort of takes advantage of that, slams it. Mala is money. Walks out the door, th throat punched. Like the edit was actually really quite good. It's like boom. Uh, she drops, Lacey Evans is there, turns around and legs it. Uh, this this is when they then meet in sort of a mutual area around sort of uh, 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 near in front of an elevator, but that, and that's when they meet up with the men. Uh, before we do that, Let's, 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 let's go back to the men for a little bit. So the men, uh, this start was so, so much better. So the guys started in the gym and compared to the women who all remained pretty much silent the whole time, the guys were shit talking each other. They're all confident and cocky. Like AJ Styles comes out. He's like, yeah, money in the bank. Woo. He's getting all super humped up. And then Otis comes in. Otis is like, you know, doing his like, oh yeah. You know, like biceps is good for lifting. and green. Like they're just smack talking each other. And, you know, AJ, AJ is just sort of like, you know, bullshit with him which i really got which i thought was absolutely fantastic alice the black comes in <laughs> and you see otis go yeah ali black and uh it's just these little touches that really kind of added a lot so as they're smack talking so between uh alice the black and uh aj styles king corbin comes in he's talking smack as well which was fantastic then 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 drew uh sorry then daniel bryan comes in big shit eating grin he's super fuck he was super excited is getting very very keen and then ray mysterio comes in and then they just start fighting in the gym wait you know but -da 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 -da. i love it loved it then weights get picked up weights get thrown at the mirror shout of the mirror Baron Corbin presumably has bad luck. I'm like, oh man, foreshadowing. He's about to get yeeted off the building. Doesn't happen. Uh, so they sort of all get paired off. We get Alice the Black, Daniel Bryan. We get uh, uh, Ray and Otis. Then we get, uh, uh, sorry, AJ and Otis. Then we get Ray and uh, Corbin, I believe. No, sorry, I, make that, make, I was wrong. Corbin and Daniel. In short, uh, Otis and AJ get to a point where, uh, where AJ's on the mat on a mat of a, of a weight bench. Otis picks up this heavy ass dumbbell uh, barbell, puts it on his chest. AJ can't get out. Loved it. 
I loved it. Uh, he, everyone sort of scoots to get out of that point. Ray's like, uh, AJ's like, Ray, help me, help me. Ray refused to help. Moving on. Uh, I feel like I'm just getting stuck in the weeds here. So I'm just going to start ripping through this. We then see AJ Styles find an Undertaker room uh, after seeing a picture of him sort of demonstrating some some PTSD around the WrestleMania Boneyard match, which I think some great storytelling, especially when he no-sold um, dying last week uh, on Raw. I thought that was a great little touch. Uh, we see uh, a couple of cameos. We see Brother Love, who I, I'm aware of, but I don't know his history, so I didn't really care too much. Uh, we see uh, Boink the Clown at some point. Uh, and we see uh, John Laurinaitis, who I don't know either. I'm aware of his name because I, you know, I took some notes, uh, but I didn't know who he was. He took a part of the face. Um, Side thing as well, like before they get to this where they the men and women cross paths, they're in front of another elevator with a bunch of ropes on it. Hey, Jacob, how's it going? Uh, and then they're they're kicking, and a Corbin's tied up in the ropes in these ropes one, at one point. Uh, <laughs> Brian's doing yes, doing kicks. We're getting the yeses from Otis, which I thought was brilliant. Then once Baron was out, Brian took that onto Otis. He's like, no, no, no. Loved it. I thought it was absolutely amazing. And then they eventually meet up in front of the elevator. And we have uh, Paul Heyman sitting in front of a catering table, eating a bunch of food. Uh, I did predict that at some point catering would be involved. I did not predict a food fight. Um, but I also uh, uh, didn't see the women and women cl- clashing each other. and just But it's, uh, it sort of went into full gear once a sandwich hit Otis and he got all excited by the ham and then requested a food fight. Food fight ensued. Good cross between the men and the women here. Uh, nothing too major. The only one thing of real major note was uh, Shayna Baszler going for the uh, the the clutch uh, on Ray, which then she released to have both Otis and Nia slam into him like a pancake, and he falls down. Uh, so lots of super kicks happening. Nothing too crazy. Dana still has uh, the, <laughs> the frame around her, which made me laugh. Uh, yeah, then we're moving on. Moving on. Eventually, we get to the roof. The women come through to the roof first. We see Oscar first. Now, at this point, Oscar has thrown not a single punch. Uh, she has not punched, fought anything. So, if this if this was the video game, she made it to the final bar. She played true sneaky fashion and got to the got to the the, the roof uh, with a full health bar. Uh, she was then followed by Nia and Lacey. Shayna just sort of fucked off at some point. Uh, Carmella, after being put through the table by Nia, was sort of down and out. So we only did only have the the four other women. One, four? No, because Dana didn't make it to the roof either. I don't think. No, she did. I don't know. Either way, they're on, they're at the top. They're all going for the ladder. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, Nia go, attempts to go for a gorilla press on Lacey. And it's like the shittiest real press I've ever seen in my life. Like, it was absolute shit. You know, uh, he's like, Ugh. Oh. but they can see they tried to avoid it because this is all done in one take, obviously. They've tried to avoid the, the dodgy press uh, from with, with changing camera angles, but it didn't really work. Um, we see them scurry. We see them bust around for a little while. Um, you know, women's right to Nia she's down and out uh in short Oscar's climbing the ladder gets there Baron Corbin comes in at some point he's trying to get up trying to stop her from grabbing the briefcase for some reason I don't understand why Baron was trying to stop Oscar from getting the briefcase either way but she he gets whacked in the face he's down Oscar is your Mrs. Money in the bank uh well incredibly well deserved I think she was I I originally predicted that Shayna would take the belt, but only because I thought that they would be pushing towards that storyline with Becky. Um, but as we've come to learn that that is not the case for a number of reasons, uh, because Raw has aired the time that I'm recording this show, and we'll have a lot more to talk about that tomorrow. But I do certainly believe that this is uh, the right choice, and I do also think that it is the right choice. It, it is it is a reward. Um, Oscar has unquestionably been one of the the starring things within this qu- uh, quarantine era, the empty arena era, whatever they want to call it. She has been a standout, and I do believe that by her getting this title, like getting this title opportunity, it does 
it is them rewarding her. So them seeing, so like actually essentially seeing her worth and being like, no, no, no you, you've earned this. You hundred percent earned this, which I thought was great. Uh, men's final, final moments, uh, age, everyone's up there. Uh, yeah, everyone's up there at this one point, I think. Uh, yeah, in short, at one point, Baron Corbin just straight up yeets both Rey Mysterio and Alistair Black off the building. Um, you know, after him breaking that mirror in the gym, thought maybe the luck would be against him and he would be the one to go over overboard. Not the case. I'm hoping that uh, in in the episode of Raw, they sort of answer it in some way that they don't just fall to their death. That maybe they fall and land in one of those window washer trays or something, you know, sort of not to have them fall off a 10 story building. It's a good way to write off Ray though. If he wants to take some time off. Uh, yeah, there, the final moments, AJ Styles climbing, the, climbing the ladder, Baron Corbin's climbing the ladder, very similar to the, uh, WrestleMania SmackDown tag team title, uh, situation briefcase unhitched. Both Baron and AJ are holding onto the briefcase. Therefore there is no defer- no determined winner out of nowhere comes Elias with a guitar smashes Baron Corbin. He stumbles and falls off the ladder. This causes AJ to stumble. Uh, briefcase goes airborne. Otis catches it. Otis is your Mr. Money in the Bank. Now, this is after him sort of coming into the ring, having a moment of t- moment to shine, but it was unable to climb the ladder due to his size. He'd step on the rung, the rung would break off. Uh, so it was absolute, complete upset on that, on that for everybody else. Uh, in terms of Otis being the Money in the Bank winner, it is not what I expected. I thought they would be going a much safer option with the likes of AJ Styles or potentially going the complete, complete, you know, in your face, uh, make you cry option of Baron Corbin. However, uh, having a go to Otis is also additionally to Oscar. I think it is a reward. Uh, Otis is over as hell right now, especially without a crowd. He is still in, he is still exceptionally over. He is the, one of the best standout storylines of SmackDown. So this is a good reward for him and giving him a moment to uh, continuing his moment to shine. Additionally, however, uh, by the question would be moving on here. Where does this take Otis? Is Otis going to go for the universal championship? No, I don't believe so. I believe that he will be going for the SmackDown tag team championship because right now he is having a bit of a, a one note. Oh, sorry. One character story with Mandy Tucker's nowhere to be seen. And we do know that with Otis's character, he and, uh, Tucky, uh, very close. They're like brothers. There's a deep, deep love between the two of them. And I think that this would be an opportunity to repay Re, so repay Tucker for his support. Uh, it, there's a little friendshipy thing. Uh, and seeing as they, neither of them have really had the opportunity to go for the SmackDown title right now, the tag titles, I believe this is a great way and a sort of a, a surprise outcome. Um, cause it, it, the briefcase is primarily used to go for the big singles titles, right? So why not have it go for the tag titles? Now, the, one of the big complaints that people, many people have around, uh, WWE is tag wrestling. Like, you know, WWE doesn't care about tag wrestling and for the longest time and majority, most of the time that is a hundred percent true. Uh, however, if you have a look at the last episode of SmackDown, there was almost, I think it was what, three tag matches, uh, and we're seeing more and more tag matches on SmackDown. So it is almost as if they're aware that they the, the criticisms and they may be trying to prove a point right now, uh, because of their competitors doing a staggeringly better, uh, job of it. Uh, so maybe this is them trying to take advantage of a, a good singles push Additionally, let's take advantage of that and then we'll add the tag titles in there as well. Uh, because, you know, it is one of those things with the distraction of having Otis in this storyline with Otis, uh, sorry, with Mandy, Sonya, Sonya and Dolph. 
if there is a situation where there is a tag a tag title match going or a tag match going on and the forgotten sons are say decimating the new day uh in a big old bus knowing that they got the win semi recently uh, like la two weeks ago um we know that they have the ability to knock down the champs so they the new day get all pulverized by the uh forgotten sons somehow get the win or it's a non-title match uh then out comes otis and tucky briefcase boom one two three they become smackdown tag team champions that's how i see it going i believe that that is a much much better outcome uh however i do also see them uh possibly going a different route now this this take uh comes from the podcast listened to called steven larson uh they were discussing about the idea of sort of a sympathy approach with with otis uh because even his approach with stepping on the rungs of the ladder and breaking the ladder sort of it's 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 supposed to make you feel sort of yeah feel sympathetic towards him and his inability to to climb the ladder being a larger dude and i guess uh, his his entire storyline right now has been been very sympathetic sympathy focused very sympathetic in terms of you know he got shafted by Dolph and then eventually he gets the girl gets the girl etc um so i do wonder to add to their take where whether we will see whether we'll see the likes of Baron Corbin uh, get up and involved in this story uh, and that maybe Otis has to put the briefcase on the line at some point and it gets taken away from him by Baron. So Baron gets like a ton more heat, even though I don't know how much, he's got to be nuclear at this point. He's got so much heat, uh, but also a lot of sympathy towards Otis. Pardon me. So maybe he can bring back that title. The, the, oh, you see. He can win back the briefcase at a later point, or he can, you know, then have a, a title, a, a tag title shot later at some point. There's a bunch of different places this can go, and the sympathy route does make a lot of sense because, you know, it it, it is, yeah. Uh, Willow, so Jacob the check goes, he's almost in X-Pac territory. He does almost have X-Pac, uh, X-Pac go away heat. Um, that, that is, like, probably one of those big up there cases, but, uh, yeah, it's... It's it's very very jarring with with Baron Corbin. So that does bring us to the end of our money in the bank discussions. While I put out my final thoughts, chat if you want to let me know what you think, Mad Dog Jacob, etc. Uh, let me know what your thought, what your overall thoughts were for Money in the Bank. Uh, I myself, I really truly enjoyed the ladder match at the end. Uh, I laughed the whole way through it i had a thorough thorough good time i thought it was fantastic like i'm sure if i you know if i look back at now and i break it down in its parts i'm like "Mm." but while watching it i thought it was brilliant um i was watching it with with jacob and uh, you know, you know, I was giggling the whole time. And then on top of that, the completely unexpected win by Otis is a great, great touch because, uh, you know, I popped and I knocked my microphone and a bunch of stuff over is in pure excitement for seeing it. Um, and it's a complete swerve, you know, like we, we have been, we have been conditioned to believe that Vince will book a certain way because he does. So on top of that, we're like, okay, well, these are the expected outcomes for that reason. Um, and with the internet clamoring for Otis, like, you know, give Otis a push, give him his shot, give him his shot. And then he gets a shot now and the internet's turned. That means they're doing something right. (laughs) <laughs> I say that because it's just that weird line between people want knowing what, thinking they know what they want when they don't really know it. But maybe this will tell a, a different opportunity, a different story. Uh, but yeah, then ask her what, yeah, it was a well-deserving win, well-deserving. Uh, the matches themselves, I really couldn't care for aside from Drew and Drew and Seth. I enjoyed that one a lot while going back and watching it. There were touches in the Bray and Braun match that I really enjoyed. SmackDown Women's, I couldn't care. Um, Truth and Lashley, couldn't care at all. Hardy and uh, Hardy and Cesaro, couldn't care. 
Um, with the SmackDown match, I cared. It just really threw me off that I knew exactly how it was going to go down. Because whenever you see the Lucha House Party in a match, you know what they're there for. Uh, and that's a bit disappointing. Um, but yeah, so anyway, uh, Jacob in the chat goes, it was kind of a bland pay-per-view, but uh, the Money in the Bank match was the only redeeming quality. I wouldn't go that far. I thought the Seth Drew match was was fantastic. But um, it is. It is it is what saved it otherwise. Uh, to be honest, uh, I care more about the kickoff match than most of the main card. Which makes sense. I know Jake is a bit of a Jeff Hardy fan. So, um, yeah, I can, I can certainly understand that. But uh, if I was to get the usual rating, I would probably give it, yeah, right down the middle. It was, uh, it's a Kurt Angle. Uh, not a Kurt Angle, Kurt and a bar. It's a straight Kurt Angle. I, I'm being very generous with that Kurt, um, especially as the majority of the matches were kind of bland and boring and didn't really deliver. <sighs> But anyways, so that's the end of my solo show. I recorded for just under an hour all by myself, which is, you know, I'm quite impressive. I'm quite impressed with that, actually. My mouth, very, very parched. Very, very parched. But uh, this Money in the Bank review came at you on a Wednesday. It arrived at 8 a.m. on your podcast services, 9 a.m. on those YouTubes. If you want to join that wrestling conversation, head over to facebook.com slash group slash the pop cultures. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, discord all those links are in the down below area if you want if you want to join the conversation as it happens head over to twitch.tv slash the pop cultures where you can watch us record this show live and be part of the conversation just like mad dog just like will uh sorry it's will <laughs> just like will it's just like jacob just like sarah and dad bod and buddy watson it was a bunch of good time now mad dog adds in as well i loved the fact that it was short and i loved the money in the bank match the braun bray match was great storytelling and the drew match was great everything else was meh Spot on there, Mad Dog. Absolutely spot on. One thing we'd like you to do, though, is to share the conversation. Tell your friends, tell your family about this little wrestling pod. Uh, we do have a lot of fun here, and we would like to be able to share it out with everybody else. Uh, now, you can also support the show at uh, popcultures.com. Uh, sorry, at patreon.com slash thepopcultures uh, or popcultures.com slash shopping. My shirts, other ship with our logos on it. Our uh, store is on sale, sale right now. If you want to get yourself a little bit of merch, there's a you know, it's a good time to go get it. But uh, you know, it is tough and we understand that. But, anyways, we will see you uh, in 24 hours to talk about Roll. Until then, I'm Ryan Betson and uh, bye. <laughs>